Hello and welcome to Fintech Insider Insights. I'm Nicole Perry, Strategy Director of Digital Business Growth at 11FS. In today's episode, we're asking, would you trust Twitter or Facebook to handle your banking? At the end of 2022, Elon Musk held a meeting with Twitter employees laying out his big plans to turn the social network into a bank, complete with a high-yield money market account, debit cards, checks and loans. Elon is not the first social media mogul to see the power of combining banking and social networks, but to date, the melding of likes and filters with APIs and KYC has proved difficult in many markets. So in this show today, we've put together a panel of experts to discuss how have these two worlds collided so far, what's the biggest challenge stopping social media banks from happening, and what could happen in the future. We'll discuss all of this and more in today's show, but first, a few brief messages don't go anywhere. In today's volatile market, financial services companies that want to thrive must prioritise customer loyalty and engagement. Amplitude, the number one self-service digital analytics platform, helps teams identify key drivers of retention and opportunities for improvement. With Amplitude's insights, you can build your product to increase transactions, retain customers, and grow loyalty. To succeed in today's market, visit Amplitude.com. Hello and welcome, LFG people, to Fintech Insider. Launching Insider, 11FS Spotlight. 11FS Explores. Open mic night. After dark. Through our podcasts, videos, newsletters, and live events, we have a direct line to a truly global fintech community. So if you're looking to sponsor and collaborate on content that connects with everybody from fintech beginners to the biggest VCs, then chat to our team at sponsors at 11fs.com or visit 11fs.com to find out more. Long live the community. Let's get started. As always, I am joined by a panel of amazing guests who can shed some light on this super interesting topic. First off, I'm joined by my 11FS colleague, Ross Gallagher, Venture Manager at 11FS. Thanks for joining us, Ross. What's your stance on social media banks? Yeah, great to be here, Nicole. Um, I think, I mean, look at first glance, I think it's a bit of a disturbing concept, right, if I'm being completely honest, but I'm I'm looking forward to digging a little deeper uh, as we go through the show. Okay, okay. Uh, quite the provocative adjective there, disturbing. Uh, we'll see if your uh, thoughts are shared um, by our other two guests, one of which is Jason McCullough, publisher of Fintech Business Weekly. And it's a welcome return to Fintech Insider for you, Jason. Thank you for being here. And could you give our listeners a bit about you and Fintech Business Weekly? Yeah, thank you so much for having me back. Uh, I mean, if your listeners don't recall, I've been in the banking and consumer credit space for 10, 12 years and FinTech Business Weekly, we aim to go beyond the headlines to analyze the latest trends in tech, regulation and business models that are driving the evolving financial services landscape. Great. Thank you, Jason. Super interesting stuff. And last but by no means least, we have Nick Milanovic, editor of This Week in Fintech. Great to have you back, Nick. And can you remind our audience uh, a little bit about This Week in Fintech? Yeah, definitely. We're a uh, fintech community with uh, 50,000 members around the world in different fintech ecosystems um, and an associated early stage uh, fintech seed fund. Thanks for having me on the show, Nicole. You are so welcome. All right, let's dive in. So let's start by setting the scene on how the worlds of social media and fintech have collided to date. In an ideal world where everything goes right, well, what does a social media bank actually look like? Is that organising plans with friends and splitting bills in one app? Is it, you know, all the way from tipping creators directly from a connected bank account or being paid directly and instantly for the content that you produce? Nick, what's what's your kind of view of, of what's happened to date? Any of those examples ring true? I, I think the answer differs based on whether you're in the US or outside of it. I think we've seen interesting inroads into financial services from providers um, like WhatsApp, for instance, that's getting into banking, insurance, credit and lending services in India, um, but it's tailor fit to the right market. In the US, it normally looks a little bit more like payments, being able to send peer-to-peer payments but not wholesale banking services. I'm 
a little skeptical that we're going to see kind of wholesale banks born out of social media companies. But I do think that facilitating basic financial services is going to happen more and more. Okay, thanks, Nick. What's your view on that, Jason? Are you aligned in thinking that we'll see more of this coming? I mean, I think Nick makes an excellent point that how this unfolds is going to be highly determined by geography, by market, right? So what makes sense in India versus Brazil versus the United States or the UK is going to look really different for a whole lot of reasons that I'm sure we're going to get into. You know, I think it's also worth um, thinking about how social media you know, has changed from uh, where it started as social networking. And there is a bit of a difference there, right, from close communication with people that you know to more of a broadcast medium, uh, which feeds into sort of the creators and influencers and, and what those people might need uh, or expect from, from an app as far as uh, payment or banking capabilities goes, and also where where social media is going. You know, I don't want to go on some Twitter Elon Musk rabbit hole today, um, but you know, it's not frozen, right? It's continuing to evolve, and I think the trend you see, whether it's with things like this week in fintech or, or other you know other communities, is moving from very very public broadcast mediums like Twitter. Uh, or Facebook, et cetera, to what I think of as kind of semi-private communities, whether that's in Slack or Telegram or WhatsApp. So the, you're seeing the way people use these platforms change, and in turn, what people might need or want as far as banking capabilities is going to be aligned with that. That's a super interesting observation of the sort of difference between social networking and social media. And I wonder if the strategies for embedding financial services into social will differ depending on whether it's to serve the networking aspect of the whole concept of social or whether it's to serve the media and sort of creative content part of that. And just to kind of touch on that, uh, kind of more of the media side, because you could argue that there's some there's a, a higher uh, ratio of underserved needs when it comes to the creator economy. And Ross, I'd love to know your thoughts about, you know, how big a market opportunity is uh, the creator economy if if a company were to get it right. Yeah, and, and, and creators, I think, are such an obvious segment, right? Be simply because they rely on social media platforms to distribute their content. I think there was a, uh, a survey that they did um, a couple of years ago uh, on the, I think, the 50th anniversary of the, the first moon landing, where they compared different types of jobs, future careers, and they asked school children, and they said, you know, would you like to be an astronaut? Would you like to be an accountant? Would you like to be a creator? And everybody wants to be a creator, right? It, 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 went, it went way beyond all of those what we would consider traditional careers, right? And why wouldn't it? Because you can be your own boss, you can make money um, doing the things that you love. I think there's around about 50 million people today globally that consider themselves creators. I think there's about 2 million of those, um, around about 2 million, 2 million plus that have actually turned that into their their sort of primary source of income, right? The rest of them, it's, it's more of a side hustle. Um, I think it's estimated at about $104.2 billion as of um, 2022 and growing rapidly, right? So. The, the market is there. And Nicole, I think you made a really interesting point. I'm all about sort of meeting people where they are, embedding financial services at the point of need, right? But I think that has to be done in the right way. And I think creators are like a highly, highly diverse segment. So it doesn't feel like a one size fits all approach is going to work here. Yeah, I, I would agree with that, Ross. Although I wonder if there's sort of um, some shared commonalities in terms of where they struggle when it comes to financial services. So we know that, you know, getting paid for the work that you do is really difficult. Or actually, if you are in that segment of people um, that have this as a full time job and maybe want to grow the business, trying to get lending based on income streams that are unusual to banks and the way that credit uh, modelling and whatnot has been built is really different. A any thoughts on that, Ross? Yeah, I listen, I completely agree. And I think um, lots of the, the the sort of maybe more quick win features, things like um, tipping, they've, they've been implemented, they've been well received um, across the board. But I think 
distribution, right, is just one part of the the process for creators. You know, before that, there's actually creating the the content. There's um, if, for example, you're creating content um, as part of a, a brand campaign, then there's like almost an entire sort of like project management piece that goes on in the background, sort of the relationship manager, the expectations management piece. And I think social media platforms don't have visibility over any of those processes, right? So I would question whether they actually own enough of the user interaction to 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 pull them into like a full banking offering or a full banking ecosystem. And then I think there's also specialist providers like Monet, for example, who I know we've talked about previously on the show, they offer like bespoke financial services products tailored to the needs of creators, right? Invoice financing being a really good example. And we're already seeing these guys sort of build out a base of customers. And now they're starting to scale out the products that they offer. So that to me feels like a more natural route to market where you can sort of maybe service the needs of creators in a more comprehensive way. All right. Thank you for the thoughts on that. If we take a step back to kind of just, uh, you know, it's wider than the creator, uh, the creator economy, do we have any examples of where we've seen successful integrations between social media and financial services? Jason, any of them spring to mind? Yeah, I mean, uh, a very recent example, which I'll admit was surprising or was news to me, was the work that JP Morgan has done with TikTok. Um, I am apparently too old to actually be on TikTok, and if I were, it would only be videos of Labradoodles. Uh, But apparently, users sent something like $3.4 billion worth of essentially virtual goods or virtual tips uh, on TikTok globally last year, up from $2 billion the year prior. And, you know, you have to imagine that the individual creators who are receiving those funds you know, presumably I can't go to like Starbucks or the grocery store and pay with the balance I have in my TikTok wallet, although you certainly could build that capability. What I understand Chase to be doing or JP Morgan to be doing uh, for TikTok in some markets is provide that like local market cash out capability, right? So, I mean, there are, you know, there are examples in the true sort of social media realm uh, and something closer to home for for me, uh, and I think for Nick as well, is Substack, right? I mean, Substack, through partnership with Stripe, makes it extremely simple to accept credit card payments for subscriptions uh, and then move that money into your local you know, business bank account, personal bank account. So, I mean, there certainly is a lot of activity happening here. You know, the, the question of will a average user of a platform like Instagram or Twitter, you know, not somebody who's a content creator trying to make a living or a side hustle, but just a, somebody who's using this day to day as a distraction. You know, is there a capability there that is meeting some need in that person's life? Uh, I'm I'm not yet convinced, but perhaps this conversation will change my mind. Yeah, I, th- I think it's about well, what's the problem for the uh, users that are not content creators to be solved and also is the confidence and level of trust there to be conducting financial services activity um, within the sphere of social. Uh, but they were great examples and, and ones that are showing that there there is a need and there's, there's growth and success to be felt there. What about those that haven't gone less well? Nick, any examples of of that? Um, I think it's still pretty early days. And so it, it depends on the network. You know, if you look at social media networks um, out of China, um, you know, looking at Baidu, looking at Weibo, looking at their integrations with Alipay, financial services have become like the basic bread and butter rails um, of how you're able to exchange money um, on so, some of these networks. Um, and I think that that's why you're seeing, you know, as Jason and I both mentioned, forays into insurance and credit offerings through WhatsApp in uh, India and Brazil. But these are all kind of very early product archetypes. And I'm not going to be surprised if in the next decade we see other services like TikTok embedding creator CFO tools so that you can manage all of your payments in one place. We're starting to see YouTube uh, providing more accounting based on the, the user type for creators. So some of these Products will catch on. Some of them won't, and they'll be wound down slowly. But I, I don't imagine with the size and scale of these social media networks that we're really going to see crash and burn. It's not going to be 
kind of a move fast and break things entry into financial services. And the reason for that is because these companies are so large that they have, you know, basically a foot in the door with regulators at all times. Um, they're constantly under scrutiny, whether it's antitrust or communications or data usage. And I don't see them making forays into financial services that are haphazard. So maybe the product doesn't catch on, but in all likelihood, it's going to be extremely buttoned up, whatever these products are that are launched, and it's going to be done in tandem with regulators. Very, very true. You've touched on some of the challenges there, and I'd like to move us kind of onto that as a topic area. So we asked our FinTech Insider audience on Twitter and LinkedIn whether they would bank with Twitter, and we received 1,200 votes. We had yes, saying it was just 17% saying that they would bank with Twitter and no, uh, 83% of people, uh, yeah, they wouldn't they wouldn't bank with Twitter at all. Um, Jason, I know you didn't want to go down the rabbit hole of Twitter, but it's somewhat impossible to avoid. Do you think that this response is more about Twitter's chaotic energy at the moment or is it something more than that that's driving, driving the no answer? Uh, I mean, I think... There's multiple components here, right? I mean, the trustworthy or lack thereof is certainly a factor, right? If you're saying, would you bank, uh, you know, in any regard, but let's pretend it's your, you know, your primary bank account, I'm getting my paycheck here, I'm paying, you know, my rent, my mortgage, whatever, you know, do I want to trust that to any service where the, you know, the leadership has been as erratic as Elon Musk and and Twitter over the last, whatever, six months, 12 months, like, no, you know, uh, I I probably want a a bank where I feel confident that, that, you know, my money is safe and that, you know, I'm going to be able to access it when I need to. I mean, I think the, you know, second and unrelated sort of question is why, why would I, right? What is the, what is the benefit of banking with Twitter uh, versus, you know, any other financial services company. And I don't remember exactly all of the sort of narrative that that uh, Musk put out there, but I want to say a lot of it kind of centered around, you know, the idea of basically peer-to-peer payments. So like, okay, I'm on Twitter, you know, Nick's on Twitter, Ross is on Twitter, I can send them money and they can send me money. It's like, okay, I, I guess, but there's already a bunch of services that do that with, frankly, better coverage, right? If I'm in the US, I'm going to be using probably Venmo or maybe Cash App or Zelle, depending on you know who I'm going out to dinner with. If I'm here, home in the Netherlands, everybody uses Tiki, uh, and it's sort of bank independent as, as Cash App and, and, um, and Venmo are. So it's just, what what is the unique value proposition that Twitter can solve that either has not already been solved or, or that we trust them to solve for us. And, and you know, beyond the creator stuff that we already sort of talked through, which is unique to a very small proportion of people who are active on Twitter. I would like to make money on Twitter, but I do not. You know, that, okay, that's a real use case that that I can imagine building some capabilities around. But for, you know, to call it a bank and and the idea that, a, uh, you know, a, a everyday user of Twitter wants that, I just don't see how that could possibly happen. Yeah, I think that's a really fair assessment. And if you think about some of the players that you mentioned that are already doing this, they were solving for a very specific need that wasn't being solved for. I'd just like to top, uh, touch on what you said about trust. I, I mean, you're certainly not an o- alone when you say maybe you wouldn't be so comfortable uh, banking with Twitter. Uh, we know that according to a survey by Insider Intelligence, that for US adult social media users aged 18 to 76, quite a wide sample there, security of data and privacy was the leading factor affecting trust. Ross, do you think that the data and privacy concerns that come with social media platforms make them fundamentally incompatible with banking? It's a bold question. I'm going to give you a bold answer. Yes, yes, I do. Um, I think, look, I, I, I think Jason... I think you hit the nail on the head when you said, look, it's hard to sort of really evaluate the potential that a Twitter or a Facebook has when it comes to being successful with a financial services offering or proposition when we don't really know what that proposition is and we don't really understand, like you said, the sort of unmet need that it addresses for users and for consumers. And I think in the absence of that, right, 
it, it does just that general concept of like Facebook bank, Twitter bank, it does just sort of invoke for me a number of red flags and most of them are in relation to trust. I mean, there's there's no way that I would sit here and tell you or any of our listeners that I would happily bank with the company that was behind the Cambridge Analytica scandal, right? I mean, I feel like they already have enough of my personal data. Actions speak louder than words. They've They've got form when it comes to misusing that data. And for me, the thought of, then handing over my personal financial information just gives me just gives me shudders. Okay, okay, very fair. Also, uh, we can't forget about um, the uh, aspects of regulatory conditions and support in this area. Nick, do you think that regulators would want to support social media outlets becoming banks? Well, first of all, I'll say I think Jason and uh, Ross are both about to have their Twitter account suspended. So, Elon, if you're listening to this, I love the Twitter PA idea. I, th- I think everything you do is great. Please keep me on Twitter. <laughs> um, <laughs> um, I, you know, so the question about like regulatory perspectives on on social media banking is really interesting, and I think it highlights um, something kind of broader about this topic, which is that maybe we're not phrasing the question in exactly the right way. Um, you know, will social media companies become banks? It feels a little bit like asking, you know, how many horses should we put inside of a car chassis? You know, cars were a revolution because they moved beyond the existing mode of transportation, but it was a completely different product archetype. Um, And so when we talk about financial services offered through social media companies, I think saying, is the social media company going to become a bank takes this analog kind of outdated web 2.0 archetype and tries to cross apply it to offering financial services. And so it's not really social media companies becoming banks, it's social media companies becoming providers of financial services in a way that's moving beyond the need for banks in that specific instance. Um, And I think when you're a regulator, you kind of have like this very backward looking perspective. Um, You know what products have existed and how you regulated them based on their failures before. They say regulations written in blood, banks have failed in certain ways. And so you developed a regulatory regime uh, to create safety and soundness within banking that may not necessarily apply to how products are offered through financial services. So I know, you know, I've talked a little bit about how the answer depends here on how you slice it. And I've talked a little bit about geographies. What I love that Jason and Ross are alluding to is slicing this by user types. So if you, you know, to Jason's point, if you poll the average Twitter user about whether they would bank with Twitter, they'll probably say no. But what Ross has brought up is, you know, there is a small but a vibrant creator economy ecosystem. Uh, there's 2.6 billion YouTube accounts. It's about 30% of the world has a YouTube account. Um, there's, you know, about 3 million people active on Twitch at any one time. Um, and a lot of these people are exchanging payments, whether it's people collecting payments for ads, whether it's people directly collecting micropayments for subscription services. And so, you know, you have this small user type that is lucrative, um, even though it's very power law distributed. And those people probably want financial statements from the platforms that they're using to develop creator services. Um, They probably want that to plug into QuickBooks or whatever accounting platform they're using. And a lot of times with the most successful people who, as Ross said, are making a living off of this, um, they probably want to be able to um, pay directly the editors and the managers and the administrators that are all on their team as they're creating content um, and do this through the social media platform like TikTok that they're posting on rather than having to reconcile everything into a bank account and then move out of that bank account into an accounting platform and then have the payments be delayed as they go into their manager and their editor and their photographer and everything. And so for this like small subset, which is you know a lucrative part of the economy, they probably would say, yes, we want to access financial services directly in the platforms that are collecting payments from our you know consumers on our behalf. And so going back to your question on regulators, to a regulator, you know, they might be thinking, all right, well, what's the bright line here? Does that mean that TikTok is becoming a bank? No, but it's becoming a bigger provider of financial services. And so you have to evaluate based on the construct that TikTok's using, whether you regulate that like a bank, whether, um, you know, you pass it off to a partner bank the way that many do with renting charters, or whether this is kind of a new third model. Sorry, long answer, but. No, such, such strong points. And I was just thinking, you know, what you'd said about, 
there'll be certain financial services activities that may be embedded they're not necessarily going to become a banking institution and I was thinking about how that might actually impact their strategies about what they choose to launch who they choose to serve and and what the, the business model is surrounding that so yeah you touched on that with kind of the partner banking model versus trying to build it build it all from scratch uh, so on the, on the topic of build uh, Jason from an engineering perspective do you think that social media um, kind of leadership teams are informed about you know what it would take to really build a supporting back end and infrastructure of some of the things that, examples that we've been talking about or do you think that shapes of teams would have to change to accommodate that uh, I mean caveat that this will have to be like a highly speculative answer as I haven't worked with any uh, big social media companies or teams that are trying to build financial services capabilities I mean uh, I will say from you know my time working in both marketing and product management at financial services companies, you know, including at a bank, um, I will say that the culture, including around engineering processes and sort of risk management, risk control, risk tolerance, is very different than in other businesses. Um, I mean, if you you know push some change to production and you know, mess something up, whether that's having uh, you know a customer-facing marketing statement that that is not you know not been validated is not appropriate, or you know potentially more catastrophically doing something like double debiting or double crediting ACH files, which unfortunately I've worked at companies where that's happened. You know, you have a real what well, you have a real customer problem. You know, because potentially you've caused that person serious, you know, financial harm that you hopefully need to make good on, and you may have a very serious regulatory problem. So again, caveat: I'm not myself an engineer, haven't worked with anyone at social media companies, but I would imagine, based on my experience, that the culture and approach to the software development life cycle at somewhere boring like a bank looks probably quite a bit different than the software development life cycle at really anywhere else, to be honest, but definitely a social media company. Yeah, I totally agree. And I was just thinking about how if, if uh, you know, say Twitter did launch into financial services, the sort of lack of fluidity that that gives uh, the CEO or the, the uh, you know, leaders in the organisation to change the shape of the resource pool. So we saw... Elon, you know, trimming all of his engineering and his software development team. And if you did have financial services, that just becomes not an option. So actually, there's a bit more rigidity in what you do and how you do it. But yeah, thank you for that insight. OK, so before we move on to talking a little bit about uh, what we might see coming down the line in the future, we're going to take a quick pause here and we'll be back very shortly. Here at 11FS, we believe in explaining FS without the BS. That's why we created our 11FS Explores series, videos that break down a complicated financial services topic into something everyone can get their head around, such as non-fungible tokens, buy now, pay later, the cost of living, ESG, circular economies, embedded finance, and inclusive design. Search 11FS Explores on YouTube now. So we've talked a little bit already about the future of the integration between social media and financial services. And we've talked about some of the use cases and some of the customer segments and some of the strategies that might emerge. What I'd like to talk a little bit more about in the future is kind of what happens in the back end of, of this intersection between social media and financial services. And Ross, I'd love to get your thoughts on this. Do you think that social media platforms may actually become their own payments processors? Yeah, we heard a lot about this, didn't we? When um, OnlyFans, the adult subscription service, was uh, banning pornography, right, due to pressure from its its payments partners, um, and there was a there was a huge backlash from creators on the platform who who threatened to sort of boycott it, and it was uh, it was quite a damaging uh, quite a damaging period for for OnlyFans. They had to they had to roll back. And, and, and there was the question at the time, look, why doesn't OnlyFans just, just build its own payment system? The reality is um, that it's, it's just not that simple, right? You know, whoever is um, providing that sort of um, merchant account and those payments processing services on the back end, you know, they're, it's regulated activity. They're, they're obligated to, you know, 
rigorously assess and evaluate the people, the merchants that they're bringing onto their platform and make sure that they're sort of managing and understanding any sort of potential risk associated with that merchant, with that merchant's activities. And of course, with pornography, gambling, all of these types of activities, you're into a bit of a a shadowy area, right? And, you, you know, you will get certain payments processors, for example, who don't touch that sort of stuff. We've seen, you know, when we've sort of raised the curtain and seen behind what was actually going on with Wirecard, actually, a lot of their legitimate sort of transactions were, were sort of playing in that space. So there is genuine rep risk. But yeah, it, 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 it's really not as, as straightforward as just bringing, bringing payments processing in-house and away you go. And to avoid that, kind of change, I suppose, from one type of organisation to another. Do you think, Nick, in the future we'll see new social media companies launching with payments and aspects of banking, aspects of financial services actually built in from the beginning? I I think so. Um, You know, everybody's caveated it here, but I'm not an expert on social media either. Um, But I do think we are going through a phase transition in social media right now. The first generation of social media was very winner take all. We saw large monolithic platforms like Facebook and uh, Instagram and, and Twitter, you know, become one size fits all for every different user type. And now I think we're seeing a couple trends within social media. One is this move towards authenticity, um, where a lot of TikTok and Be Real is about being unvarnished um, with younger generations rather than very curated. Um, and the other is I think we're seeing people break out into different social media networks that are more tailor fit for their user type. Um, there's people to whom be real appeals that, you know, um, isn't going to, it's not going to appeal to the Instagram set. Um, you know, obviously there's people who are kind of breaking into different content filters uh, as well, based on the type of content that they want to share. And so if that persists, I think we will probably see more and more social media companies starting up and gaining a foothold in a much more fragmented social media landscape than the uh, very concentrated winner-take-all one that we have today um, based on people's needs and their user types. And when those platforms come about, um, I'm sure that we'll have super users who monetize the content that they're putting out there um, and they'll want to have payments tools uh, integrated naturally into there um, for pay-in, pay-out, for micropayments, for sponsorship, for tipping, for ad payments to pay their teams. So I wouldn't be surprised to see this be a kind of more native feature in the future. Yeah, I completely agree with you, particularly on the point around kind of um, more concentrated groups using sort of very specific types of or very specific networks of social media. And actually to kind of flip this conversation on its head, I wonder if in the future we'll see banks using social media as a distribution network. Um, or so- social networks rather and by that I don't just mean using it for ads or um, you know marketing or whatever right, as an acquisition tool do you think Jason that we could see potentially banks developing specific products for specific customer segments that use specific networks so I'm thinking maybe you know parenting networks or some of the cohorts on Reddit do you think we would ever see any uh, collaboration between larger financial institutions, more heritage financial institutions actually using those networks to to get to get closer to customers? I mean, I'm skeptical that you would see that from any major large establishment bank. I mean, perhaps, you know, more in the like startup neo bank esque um, you know, side of financial services. Like that very much could be a competitive differentiator, competitive advantage. Ross, I think you mentioned one company, and I know there's a handful of sort of like neo bank slash financial services stack for creators. I think one of them might be called Zeta. Um, there's a handful of them that that aim to tackle some of these pain points that are unique, including I think Ross mentioned like basically invoice advance or invoice factoring, um, like the accounting piece. And and I think you also have to remember, you know, somebody who is using TikTok is probably also making money off multiple other platforms, right? They're probably cross-posting those TikToks onto Instagram Reels. Uh, Maybe they're also doing something on YouTube. You know, maybe they have money coming directly in the form of, you know, tips. Maybe they're also getting paid out from a creator fund, which both TikTok and uh, Meta Instagram have. Maybe they're also doing direct um, deals with sponsor, right? So if I'm dealing with 
whatever, like L'Oreal or whatever sort of fashion brand, they may be paying me directly to mention or talk about their product, right? So as a creator, you know, you you likely have multiple revenue streams and are interacting with multiple platforms. So I think thinking through like the creator lens, whether that is, you know, establishment banks trying to work with that segment or startups, these are the areas where pain points start to bubble up around payment flows, um, you know, accounting, reconciliation, all the boring stuff that people in, you know, running small businesses or, you know, solopreneurs do not want to deal with because that's taking away time from what actually makes money. Um, and, you know, to a point from like earlier in our conversation, you know, the, these people then look very non-traditional when it comes to underwriting things like credit. You know, uh, I mean, I somewhat had that experience, you know, applying for a mortgage here where it's like, oh, like you're self-employed, like, please go away. Um, and, you know, just because you're earning on TikTok, Meta, YouTube, like you're not going to have a W-2, you know, you're not going to have a pay stub. You have income and you can you know, prove that income, but the majority of banks you know, don't want to deal with the com- increased complexity of underwriting that kind of customer. So that does create space where, okay, if you're building a specific solution to solve this point, point, pain point, that pain point, et cetera, like, you have an advantage versus like, oh, okay, I'm just going to go use you know, Chase. I'm just going to go use even, you know, even Monzo or Revolut. They're not specifically built to address these types of challenges. Absolutely. Couldn't agree more. Um, And I know in the US, we've got a number of uh, kind of fintechs, neobanks that are trying to directly address sort of influencers as a segment. Um, And it'll be it'll be interesting to see what success they've got and whether the market actually, you know, there's enough market uh, space, enough people requiring that to actually sustain that growth. Um, But yeah, super interesting. All right, last point on this one. Uh, We can't talk about the future without talking about the metaverse. So, Ross, I'd love to uh, know what you think, you know, the metaverse dream. Where where does it fit into all of this? I don't think it fits into it. I think it's bigger. And I think this goes back to Nick's earlier point about, like, what does the future look like? Are we trying to just create this vision of the future based on where we are today? And I think it's funny because I think this whole episode actually could just turn out to be a big red herring, right? I think we're already seeing, you know, money move away in Silicon Valley from those big techs and it's going towards things like AI, you know, crypto, the metaverse. Um, and I think really the 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 future that we're going to sort of find ourselves in in that context isn't the present that we're sort of familiar with today. The types of players are going to be different Um How we interact is going to be different. How we experience it is going to be completely different. And actually, I think that potentially gives rise to, you know, experiences, interactions that we haven't even thought about. Very considered, Ross. Thank you. All right. A bit of a quick fire round now. And I feel like I could potentially already know the answer to this question, but we'll go for it anyway. Ross, I'll come to you first. Would you trust Twitter, Facebook or any other social media app to handle your banking? No. Next question. Nick? Uh, Yes, I would. Okay. Okay. Interesting. And Jason? Uh, I'm going to split the middle and say, would I trust one of those platforms to like initiate payments on my behalf? Yes. Would I store, you know, my life savings on Twitter? No, absolutely not. Yeah, I was going to go for a very uh, non-committal answer of it depends. Um, so yeah, uh, it remains to be seen, but I'm sure we'll be talking about this um, more and more over the coming months, years, weeks, days and whatnot. All right, that wraps up today's discussion. Thank you so much for joining me. Uh, Where can people find out more about you and your companies? Ross? Yep, as ever, uh, Ross Gallagher07 on Twitter or 11fs.com. Thank you, Jason. Uh, You can subscribe to the newsletter at fintechbusinessweekly.com and find me on Twitter at MakulaJA. Brilliant, thank you. And finally, Nick? Uh, You can find us at thisweekinfintech.com and on Twitter, doing all of my banking at Nick Milanovic. <laughs> send, send him money there. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Safe to say that you're 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 getting whichever premium features are about to be rolled out over the Twitter sphere. Yeah, uh, I should be giving you my like cash app tag. <laughs> yeah, exactly, exactly. 
Okay, and you can find me, Nicole Perry, uh, on LinkedIn. Or if you would like to email me, I'd love to hear from you. You can email me on nicole.perry at 11fs.com. Thank you so much for listening. If you like what you've heard, subscribe to our podcast and don't forget to leave us a review. It helps us to make it much better. and Well, not much better. It's already pretty good, uh, but always better. And uh, help others find the show. As always, if you want to join the conversation, find us on social media. Just search for 11FS or find Tech Insider or email us on podcast at 11fs.com. Thank you so much. Have a wonderful day wherever you're listening and goodbye. Goodbye.